Hi class, this is lesson two of unit six, and this is the lecture where the tension really starts to pick up after the Mexican-American War. Uh, if you look at your notes, you can see that there is a brief mentioning of the impact of the Mexican-American War, and then we're going to enter a timeline. Some of this timeline will cover things we've already talked about in past lectures, and it will also extend on up to about 1852. You will need this timeline for a worksheet that accompanies a couple of these lectures a little bit later on. But basically, uh, the Mexican-American War is going to put us on the road as a nation toward the Civil War. And we've really been grappling with this tension over slavery in the West ever since the days of the Louisiana Purchase, and honestly, before that even, with the Northwest Ordinance, if you remember that. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll talk about the Mexican-American War, and then we'll kind of revisit this theme of, of slavery in the West. Uh, if you remember, the Missouri Compromise had successfully kind of lowered the tension over slavery in the West for a while, but that was before the Mexican-American War. And after the Mexican-American War, you're going to see different attempts to compromise come and go, and ultimately they're going to fail. And there's so many events that happened in the 1850s that I could not even fit it in the single lecture. So really the next lecture after this one will be a continuation of this theme of trying to solve the issue of slavery in the West and ultimately failing. So let's first look at the Mexican-American War, which was the theme at the end of the last lecture. <clears throat> So remember that one of the things that was good for the United States was that the Mexican-American War uh, did give the United States land all the way basically from sea to uh, shining sea. So the Mexican-American War gave us this piece of land here, uh, which would include California, it would include Texas, it would include land in between. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't know what to do with that land. So we have all this land that we got from Mexico and that a lot of this land is going to become maybe a free state, maybe a slave state, uh, and that's going to become really the big issue moving forward. So the major question, you'll see that I put it in bold, is will these new states from the Mexican session, will they be free or will they be slave states? Now this map that I have here is actually a map from around 1820. It's a map of the Missouri that shows the Missouri Compromise. And if you look at the Missouri Compromise, the Missouri Compromise only really applied to the Louisiana Territory, which would be this piece of land I'm kind of trying to circle here. And the Missouri Compromise line, if you remember, only extended this far, where the mouse is. Well, since that time, we've gone and taken land from Mexico all the way to California. The Missouri Compromise does not apply to that land, and so we're going to, again, have to revisit as a nation the future of slavery in the West. And ultimately, this time, we will not be able to solve this issue. Uh, it'll. This is now, the American Civil War is now an issue of uh, when, not if. So all compromises on the issue of slavery in this new land are ultimately going to fail. And in fact, we're going to even try to attempt new compromises with uh, the land that the Missouri Compromise had tried to address. And that's going to fail as well. We'll get more into that later on. But long story short, the issue of slavery in the West will ultimately go undecided or at least uncompromised fully on. Uh, not to the, It will not... Any compromise that comes along will not satisfy both the North and the South, and ultimately sectionalism will reach a breaking point, and we will have the Civil War begin by the end of this unit. So basically, overall, the tension is going to rise and rise and rise. There will be brief moments where it seems like the tension might go down again, but ultimately the tension will reach the point of Civil War. Now the four pictures you see at the bottom I am showing because I there's a lot of tie-in between the Mexican-American War and the American Civil War. The big tie-in between the Mexican-American War and the Civil War, obviously, is that the Mexican-American War brought the issue of slavery in the West to the point that it could not be solved without Civil War. But I did think it would be interesting to note that a couple of your major generals from both sides of the war fought together in the Mexican-American War. So here you see a young Robert E. Lee, 
and here you see a young Ulysses S. Grant. By the time, and by the way, they were both fighting together in the Mexican-American War. Uh, it's not like they were close friends. Uh, they were probably acquaintances at best. Uh, they they kind of knew of each other. In fact, I think Grant remembered Lee better than Lee remembered Grant. Anyway, so here is a young Robert E. Lee. And then eventually here is a picture of him uh, later on. Remember, he becomes the main general for the Confederacy. And then if you look here, you see a young Ulysses S. Grant. And though he has lots of, of personal problems he has to deal with, he will ultimately rise to become the most famous popular general for the Union Army. And here you see his picture after uh, he had risen in the ranks in the, uh, during the Civil War. Okay, so at one point these two men are fighting together. Eventually they will be fighting against each other. And in the end, the Civil War will be resolved, for the most part, whenever Robert E. Lee surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant. More on that in the next unit. Okay, let's move forward. So let's rewind in our minds back to the time of the uh, Missouri Compromise. So in 1820, this was the first time that sectionalism over the issue of slavery really became a big deal that almost created a national, or could have created a national crisis. It wasn't the first time that slavery in the West had been discussed. The Northwest Ordinance beforehand had talked about this, but this was the first time where it could have created a national crisis. Now, remember, this also occurred during the era of good feelings when the mood of the country, which was, uh, remember, the mood was the more of a, the country was full of nationalism during this time. There was more of a willingness to compromise. So remember, in 1820, the Missouri Compromise, long before the Mexican-American War had ever occurred, had kept the number of free states and slave states equal, which was important, especially when it came to representation in the Senate. So long as the South had at least as many uh, representatives, at least as many states in the Senate as the North, if not more, then they could always block any kind of anti-slavery laws that might pass through the House of Representatives. And if you know your civics, uh, you know that the House of Representatives is based on population, and the North could always win votes there. It was in the Senate that the South wanted to maintain, or excuse me, it was, yeah, it was in the Senate where the South wanted to maintain at least equality, if not uh, having more uh, states, uh, and that way they could block any kind of anti-slavery legislation. Well, that balance between the free states and the slave states is going to go out the window by the end of this lecture. The other thing about the Missouri Compromise, remember, besides bringing Missouri in as a slave state and Maine in as a free state, is it made a decision on the rest of the Louisiana Territory, and it basically created this line that I'm showing here in the map, the 3630 line, and with Missouri being the exception, all land above this line would become free states eventually, all land below that line would become slave states eventually. And this did keep tension low, at least for a time. There was a problem, though, and that is that this only applied to the land of the Louisiana Territory. Now, why in 1820 did Henry Clay decide to only apply this compromise to the land of the Louisiana Territory? Simple answer, we didn't have any more land yet. We had not signed the Oregon Treaty with uh, England. That happened under James Polk. Uh, we had not had the Mexican-American War, which we had under James Polk. So basically, there was no other land to compromise on. So this compromise will work for a while. This compromise is going to work for about 30 years until the Mexican-American War comes along. And all of a sudden, you have all this land in this area here that I'm encircling. That's where the Mexican Cession was. And the question was, what do you do with that land? Do you compromise again? Do you just extend the Missouri Compromise all the way to the coast? Uh, what's the solution going to be to solve the issue of slavery in the West? And so that's the problem that the Mexican-American War brings to the nation. Yes, we increase our land holdings substantially. We get valuable land in Texas. We get valuable land, in, especially with uh, California. But it also brings up the issue of slavery in the West. And I'll get to the proposed solution, and I'll get to the, the Compromise of 1850 in a little bit. But I'm going to go in chronological order here. So, on to the war itself. So, the Mexican-American War is fought between 1846 and 1848. 
and in the end remember that this is going to bring in new land to the nation that both the north and the south want to influence the north wants to make this land become uh, as they want to get as many free states out of this land as possible the south wants to get as many slave states out of this land as possible and so that creates sectionalism that creates tension between the two and remember that the war itself had even caused tension because a lot of northerners like Frederick Douglass, a lot of your abolitionists that I've talked about before, like Douglass or like William Lloyd Garrison, they really saw the Mexican-American War as a conspiracy among a lot of southerners to try to get a lot more land uh, that would have slavery on it. The, the idea was that they're going to bring in this land and then they're going to try to extend the Missouri Compromise line and then create a whole lot of new slave states below that line. Uh, and remember, Texas, whenever it came into the United States, was already a slaveholding state or a slaveholding uh, country that became one of our territories. And there had already been talk about carving it into multiple states that would all be slave states. And then now the North saw this war had come and go, and they were worried that even more slave states might be created. So the war itself, again, created this fear that slavery was going to expand to the West. So to calm those fears of slavery expanding to the West, a northern congressman is going to suggest the Wilmot Proviso. We've already mentioned that. That's okay, because I'm about to tell you the consequences of the, of the uh, Wilmot Proviso. It's going to lead eventually to the creation of a new political party. So to keep the North on board with the Mexican-American War, the Wilmot Proviso suggested making all of this land, which you see being circled here, making all of it be free. And if that were to happen, then Northerners would be much more on board with the war. They would see it as not so much a conspiracy among Southerners. But guess who's not going to like the Wilmot Proviso? The Southerners. And the Southerners, because they had at least the same number of people in the Senate as the Northerners did, they were able to successfully block the Wilmot Proviso from taking effect. But they weren't happy about this because they also believe that there is a conspiracy developing. The Southern congressmen thought that the Northern states were developing a conspiracy to attack slavery, keep it from expanding to the West, and maybe destroy it entirely in the United States, which from a Southern point of view would have been a very bad thing. So you do see sectionalism on the rise. And, and really, when the Wilmot Proviso was suggested, what this does is it makes the issue of slavery in the West a very kind of formal issue. Uh, it's not just something that's getting talked about. It's actually related to a law that has been proposed, and eventually it's going to lead to an actual political party that's going to be opposed to slavery in the West. And so you're, you're seeing kind of these uh, these phantoms of, of sectionalism related to slavery in the West. They're starting to solidify into real threats, and the North is going to get increasingly... Uh, anti-slavery over time. The South is going to become increasingly pro-slavery over time, as I think the nation's realizing that this is not something that can be swept under the rug much longer. So once the Mexican-American War concludes, the country is going to be grappling with this idea of what to do with the new land we got from Mexico. What are we going to do with the Mexican Cession? And there was an idea that was proposed called popular sovereignty. There's going to be a Michigan senator you don't need to know about him. His name's Lewis Cass. He runs for president. He doesn't win. Uh, you don't really need to worry about him. But he does go down history as the person that popularizes the idea of popular sovereignty. And if you've taken a civics class, or you, if you remember from the first lecture of Unit 3, popular sovereignty means letting the people rule. So in 1848, some politicians start saying that when new states come in, to the United States from the West, they should be able to decide for themselves whether they want to be free or slave. And to a lot of people, this made sense because uh, you know the states tended to know what were their needs and what their needs were and what they weren't. And uh, so, and a lot of people believed in local government. Remember that idea of local government come. Uh, goes back all the way to the time of the American Revolution. So this seemed like a, a good idea to a lot of people, the idea of letting a state decide on its own whether or not it wanted to be free. However, that is not going to go over well with uh, 
the nation as a whole, ultimately, it's definitely not going to go over well with Northern abolitionists. Abolitionists would say slavery should not be an option because slavery is evil. That would be, uh, to an abolitionist, this would be like saying that states can decide for themselves if murder and rape should be allowed. When most sensible people would say that rape and murder are, should never be allowed anywhere, and it should not even be an option for a state to decide this. So, Northerners, uh, mainly the abolitionists, and, and again, most Northerners weren't abolitionists at this point, although they are going to, over the course of this lecture and the next lecture, become much more sympathetic to the abolitionists. Uh, but Northern abolitionists are going to feel that slavery should not even be an option, it shouldn't be a choice, uh, and so they were against popular sovereignty. But there's another problem with popular sovereignty, and that is, what if the state itself cannot decide? I've had times whenever I've been teaching, whenever I uh, had a test that was scheduled for a Friday, and I could really rush through the material to get to the test on Friday, or I could slow down on the material and have the test be on a Monday, and students seem to be pretty divided when it comes to a choice between a test on a Friday and a test on a Monday. And if I were to use popular sovereignty in my classroom and say to the students, would you like to have this test on Friday or would you like to have it on Monday? Some students would like to get it over with so they didn't have to worry about it over the weekend. Some people would like to postpone it so they could procrastinate or have more study time. And the class would not be able to decide. That's what happens in Kansas over the issue of slavery. So they try popular sovereignty in, a, in what was known as Kansas Territory. And as you can see from the picture, the two sides within the state could not decide. So the, the ultimate downfall of the popular sovereignty idea is that, one, it allowed for something that today we all know is evil, which would be slavery, to be an option. And number two, it fails largely because the state, uh, the state where it's tested, Kansas, they couldn't decide on their own, and it came to violence. You basically had a mini civil war going on in Kansas for many years, leading into the full-on national civil war that occurs or starts in 1861. Okay, again, back to the issue of slavery in the West. This was a possible solution. Ultimately, it's going to fail. We'll talk about what's known as bleeding Kansas later on. In 1848, a lot of people that were abolitionists but most of them were actually not abolitionists, but were in favor of the Wilmot Proviso. A lot of people that were against slavery expanding to the West are going to join together, and they are going to form a major third political party known as the Free Soil Party. Most of these people were not abolitionists, but this was, if you will, the best realistic option that abolitionists had, so people like Frederick Douglass decide to join up with them. So why does this party form? Well, the party forms basically on the idea that they did not want slavery to expand out west any further than it already had. Now, that's interesting to say that they're not abolitionists, because they're not. They were not against slavery itself. So they didn't want slavery to expand any further, but they were okay with slavery. Overall, the party was. There were individuals that weren't. But overall, the party was okay with slavery where it was in the South, so long as it didn't spread West. So why did they care about slavery in the West if they didn't care about slavery in the South? Well, a lot of these people were wanting to move out West. They were wanting to uh, go mining. Uh, gold is being found in California around this time and in other places uh, later on. Uh, you're going to see silver being found. You're going to see farmers wanting to move out west. You're going to see uh, cattle ranchers wanting to move out west. And these people did not want to have to compete with slaves for labor. So this was really an economic thing. A lot of these people would have been white supremacists. A lot of these people would not really care about slaves themselves. But what they were concerned about was moving out west and then having to compete for a job with a slave. And obviously a slave is going to be cheaper because slaves don't get paid. Uh, and so uh, for a lot of your free soilers, the reason against slavery in the west was so that basically the West could become white man's country and they would have all the job opportunities that they could hope for. However, abolitionists knew that 
keeping slavery from expanding westward, although it doesn't abolish slavery, is a step, if you will, in the right direction. So some abol abolitionists will join this party, but not because they exactly love the party. So, again, a lot of Northerners aren't going to like this party because it wasn't actually against slavery. It was only against slavery in the West, and it wasn't for humanitarian reasons. It was more for reasons of uh, economic opportunity. However, some of the abolitionists do join on to this party, and I'm pretty sure that Frederick Douglass was one of them, even though he th thought the party definitely had shortcomings. So is this party going to be seen as a threat to the South? I mean, the party says basically that, uh, the Free Soil Party basically says that slavery is okay in the South. That's not good enough for the South, because they do want slavery to expand West. They do want to have new states out West become slave states, and they know that if the entire West is free, then the Senate will be full of anti-slavery people eventually, or uh, and, and could become a threat to slavery even in the South. So to a lot of Southerners, they saw this as a sneaky way to attack slavery everywhere by saying that it could exist in the South, just not in the West. They saw this as a step towards going after slavery everywhere. So the Free Soil Party forms. Uh, it will last for a short time, and then eventually it will become part. Uh, it's kind of like the father of the Republican Party. So we'll get to the formation of the Republican Party later on. But the Free Soil Party, again, their main goal was not to abolish slavery. It was to keep slavery from expanding westward. Moving forward. So, if I remember correctly, this was about two weeks after the Mexican uh, session was made, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed. In other words, about two weeks after the Mexican-American War was lost by Mexico, and Mexico gave the United States, California, and, and all the land from California to Texas, gold is found in California. At this point, I'm sure that the Mexican government was very unhappy because they realized that they had given the United States a piece of land that was suddenly worth a whole lot more than they thought it was. So in 1848, gold is going to be found in California, and then word gets out, and by 1849, the gold rush is on. And so in 1849, you have tens of thousands of Americans moving to California all at once. It's a mad rush for uh, gold. And it wasn't just Americans. It was Northerners. It was Southerners. It was also people from South America, Central America. Uh, there were lots of Chinese that came over, and that's going to create nativism in California. And we've talked about nativism before in the northeastern cities. Well, in the West, you're going to see nativism. It's largely going to be to the Chinese that come over uh, to work in gold mines. Not that long afterwards, uh, you will see also a silver strike that occurs uh, in Nevada about a decade later, and that's also going to bring people out west. And, and what you're going to see is the issue of uh, what to do with California, whether it's going to become a state. And I'll talk more about that uh, momentarily. Okay, let's talk about the gold mining itself. It's a pretty interesting kind of mini culture to talk about. So whenever gold was discovered, or whenever silver was discovered, as soon as word got out, everyone would go flooding to this, this gold mine, flooding to this silver mine, especially in California. That's where most of this gold was being found. And you would liter literally see a town spring up within a week or two. And these were known as boom towns. And so you'd have, uh, and this would be kind of like your stereotypical western town from a western movie. And so you'd have these towns spring up literally overnight, or almost literally overnight, uh, and then people would go and they'd mine for gold, and then they'd spend the, the money that they made in the gold mines in uh, saloons, they'd be gambling, uh, they were, there were brothels, there were uh, hotels, uh, and basically you had like this little mini town uh, that was set up in the middle of nowhere around one of these mines. And because law and order hadn't gotten out, gotten out there yet, there wasn't much of that. People usually settled disputes on their own, on their own, oftentimes with guns. And so this, uh, th these places became known for uh, debauchery and and for violence. Uh, and then the other interesting thing to note is what happens when the gold or silver runs out. Basically, 
everyone would pack up and leave, and they wouldn't worry about taking down uh, the buildings they had made. They wouldn't worry about taking or tearing down the houses or the saloons or the grocery stores, and they would just leave, and you'd have what were known as ghost towns. And if you travel out west today, you can still go and visit ghost towns that are uh, – they're, they're starting to crumble a lot of them, but they're still there. And I've been to a few of them. It's a really interesting uh, step into the past to go into one of these ghost towns. Okay, one thing, again, worth noting is that a lot of the 49ers were Asian immigrants, some from Japan, but I believe the majority of them were from China. And they are going to experience very strong nativism. There is going to be this idea among a lot of Americans that this is quote-unquote white man's gold and silver, and that the Chinese sh do not have the right to come across the Pacific Ocean and take what belongs to Americans. So you will see nativism with this. You'll hear more about nativism uh, towards Asians later on, especially in American history, too. Quick side note, uh, a lot of this gold and silver, where did it ultimately end up? A lot of it ended up in banks in San Francisco. That's why the football team uh, the NFL football team is known as the San Francisco 49ers. It ties to the California Gold Rush. So what does this have to do with the issue of slavery? It seems like I've suddenly changed topics, and I've, I've gone from talking about slavery in the West to talking about uh, the California Gold Rush. Well, there is a connection. California grows so quickly that it completely bypasses the stage of becoming a territory and is already big enough in less than a year to become a state. And what kind of state does it request to become? It requests to become a free state. And that's going to cause a lot of problems for the southern states. Because the United States very much wanted to bring California in as part of its country. Uh, as a state, it was a very, very valuable area, a very valuable piece of land. Even if it wasn't for the gold, California would be a very valuable area. There's lots of good farmland there. Uh, the coast has lots of good port cities. And so California, there was a strong desire to bring California in. And here we have California all of a sudden requesting to come in as a free state. And the South is angry about this because at the time that California requested to become a state, if you were to look at the Senate, there were the same number of free states as there were slave states. And if California were to become a state and become a free state, then that would throw the Senate in favor of the free states. And we already know that the House of Representatives was in favor of the free states. And at this point, the balance would be in favor of free states from here on out. And if that happened, if anti-slavery feeling continued to grow in the North, then the Congress could possibly pass an anti-slavery law attacking slavery in the South. And the southern states were kind of right to have this fear. The southern slave owners are right to have this fear because ultimately uh, the federal government is going to end up turning against slavery and you're going to see the passage of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution after the Civil War, which abolishes slavery everywhere. We'll get to that in the next unit. So what does California have to do with the issue of slavery in the West? Because California, because of the gold rush, grows so fast that it can become a state literally within a year, and it requests to become a free state, which angers the South. So what's the United States going to do about all this? We must uh, be in need of another compromise. And who better to come up with this compromise than the great compromiser himself, Henry Clay? And, and this will be the last hurrah for Henry Clay. By this point, Henry Clay has been in, in uh, the federal government for 40 years. He's getting old. He's going to be dead by 1852. Uh, so this will be kind of his last uh, contribution to the nation. He's going to try to yet again settle the issue of slavery in the West in a way that prevents civil war. And this time, it doesn't really work out. In the very short term, it might, but ultimately it, it fails. So Henry Clay is going to come up with a compromise of 1850, and what this compromise deals with is what to do with slavery in the West and the Mexican Cession land, especially with California, which is exactly what the notes that just popped up says. So again, this compromise, like the notes say, will determine what to do with the land west of Texas. Remember, Texas was already a slaveholding territory and became a slaveholding state. But west of Texas, the question was, do you make the land free? Do you make the land slave? 
Do you extend the 3630 line? Uh, do you let California have its desire to become uh, free or not? And it will be proposed by Henry Clay. And remember, his Missouri Compromise had proven to be fairly successful in keeping the country from falling into civil war. Well, that was 30 years ago. Let's see if he can do it again. And honestly, uh, he's going to try to give some things to the North that the North likes. He's going to try to give some things to the South that the South likes, which he had done in the Missouri Compromise. But ultimately, this time, the compromise, compromise leaves kind of, if you will, no one fully satisfied, not even satisfied enough really to ultimately avoid civil war. Uh, so there will be this brief kind of, of sigh of relief among the the people of the nation, thinking that they might this that this compromise might fix things, but ultimately it doesn't. Okay, so let's look at the main details of the compromise. There's many details I could tell you about, but I'm going to get to the ones that matter the most. So what's the main thing that the North gets? The North gets California as a free state. So California comes in. It's going to get two senators, and it's going to throw the Senate in favor of the uh, free states. And that is really the biggest benefit of this compromise. In the end, the North gets the better end of the deal. Because in the end, from here on forward, the northern states, the free states, are going to have more power in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. So the, the South really gives up a lot when they allow California to become a free state. The next question is, what do you do with the rest of the land, the land between Texas and California, the land that I'm circling here? Well, if you look at the, the color coding here, you can see that it is open to slavery, which means basically popular sovereignty. They might have slaves, they might not. Uh, and so the rest of the land from Texas to California is going to be divided up into two territories, one being called Utah Territory, one being called the New Mexico Territory, and the idea is that both of these territories can decide for themselves whether or not they're going to be free or slave. Now if you'll notice, the line that divides the territories, most of that line is along the 3630 line. So Henry Clay was trying to basically engineer a way where the Utah Territory would hopefully go on to become a free state, and the New Mexico Territory would go on to become a slaveholding state, and that would keep close to the balance. Obviously, the balance was already thrown off with California, but this was hopefully seen as a way that would keep both sides happy. Both sides would get one of the territories. That never really becomes an issue because there weren't that many people living out in that area. A lot of that area is pretty uninhabitable. For a lot of people, it's dry desert, especially back then, that would be uninhabitable. Uh, and so, not that many people move out there. None of these areas become a state uh, till after the Civil War, except for Nevada, but that's a side story I don't need to get into. Uh, but overall, this does not become an issue because the Civil War starts before any of these places try to become a state. So, ultimately, number two, for the sake of this class, is the least important to remember. Number one and number three are the things to remember. So let me go ahead and say this. Circle in your notes number one and circle in your notes number three. Those are the two parts of the Compromise of 1850 you need to know the most. By far. You need to know the main thing that the North got. You need to know the main thing that the South got. So what did the South get out of this deal? Well, the South was pretty upset about the Underground Railroad. They were upset that they basically felt that the northern states were getting to steal their slaves from them, steal their slave property from them in their eyes. They were tired of basically a slow leak of slaves from the South to the North. And they were angry that the northern states were basically keeping their property from them and not giving it back. And so the South gets a new federal law called the Fugitive Slave Act. And the Fugitive Slave Act is going to force northerners, northern citizens, to return runaway slaves if they knew about them. If there was a runaway slave, they could be forced to help catch the runaway slave or face a penalty. And ultimately what this would do would return slaves from the north that had run away to the north back to the south. 
Now you may wonder to yourself, does this mean that Frederick Douglass has to be returned to the South? No, because uh, remember, after he wrote his book and became very popular, a lot of people put their money together and bought his freedom. So he didn't have to worry about being returned to the to uh, the South, but there were a lot of runaways that did have to worry about that. And there were also a lot of free blacks uh, that needed to worry about being accused of being a runaway. So ultimately what happens is that for a short time, this compromise is going to ease the tension because the North gets something it wants, California as a free state. The South gets something it wants, which is a Fugitive Slave Act that's going to return their runaway slaves and hopefully undo the power of the Underground Railroad. Uh, but ultimately, this tension, like the notes say, is it's going to be uh, reduced only for a short time, largely because once the northern states see the Fugitive Slave Act in action, they are going to turn more aggressively against slavery. There were a lot of people that were indifferent to abolitionism before the Fugitive Slave Act, but the next two boxes, which deal with the Fugitive Slave Act and Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book, once we get to that, you're going to see people getting off the fence and more people joining the anti-slavery, the abolitionist side of the issue. Okay, so in the picture you see there someone that looks like they're being kidnapped by slave catchers. That's probably what's happening. So as soon as the compromise is engineered by Henry Clay, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act is going to take effect, and it does end up becoming the most controversial part of the compromise. Now remember that California coming in as a free state made the North the real winner of this compromise, but the most controversial part of this compromise will be the part that benefited the South, the Southern uh, states, the slaveholding states. So why does this law become so controversial? And this relates to a question that students ask me oftentimes. A lot of times students ask me uh, earlier in the class, they'll say, why did the Northerners, why weren't more Northerners upset about slavery? Today, obviously, Americans, if they knew that slavery was going on in the United States, uh, they're going to be upset about that. Back then, a lot of Northerners didn't really have much of an opinion. They didn't seem to really care. My students say, why didn't they care now that we know how bad slavery could get? And the main reason that I tell them is because, well, one, it provided cheap cotton uh, to Northerners that they got cheap clothing out of. But also, uh, it's going to be uh, a big deal, or it's not going to be a big deal to a lot of Northerners, because uh, it was basically out of sight, out of mind. And so they didn't see slavery every day. They might have heard about it. They might have heard abolitionists talk about it, but they didn't actually see slavery in their faces every day. So since it was out of sight, it was out of mind, they didn't think of it as a big deal. Well... The Fugitive Slave Act is going to put slavery in the faces of Northerners. In fact, if you were, and I'm being literal here, if you were to be a Northerner and you were to see uh, a, a black man or woman running down the street and behind them someone chasing them saying, there's a runaway, you have to help us catch them, you had to, by law, help catch that slave. And if you did not help, then you might be given a fine. If you were found to be hiding people that were traveling along the Underground Railroad, uh, you would be fined. I don't know if you would face jail time, but you would definitely get in legal trouble. Now imagine that you're a white uh, northerner. Say you're living in Boston, and you had a black neighbor. That black neighbor may have lived there uh, their entire lives, but suddenly someone comes along with a piece of paper saying that I'm looking for a fugitive slave, and I think that your neighbor matches the description. And very oftentimes, slave catchers could get away with uh, basically falsely identifying free blacks as being runaways, and suddenly they would be kidnapping free men, uh, for, or, or people that were free, and making them into slaves. And so what would happen if one of these free blacks said, no, I'm not a slave? Uh, they basically would go to trial. It would not be a jury trial. Uh, and a judge would make a decision. And part of the Fugitive Slave Act said that the judge would get paid more to make a decision in favor of the slave catcher. So what you're going to end up seeing is, again, Northerners being forced into helping catch slaves. They'd even see their neighbors being dragged off in chains. And this could become very ugly at times. Uh, in fact, there's a story of basically the whole city of Boston rising up against uh, 
uh, slave catchers, and the Federal Army had to be brought in just to take one runaway slave back home. So what's going to be the ultimate reaction here? You're going to see Northerners who had been indifferent towards slavery suddenly begin to hate slavery because it's now a reality to them. They're seeing it as part of their lives, too. It's not something that's happening several hundred miles south. Uh, it's something that's happening in front of them. They're seeing their neighbors being taken away in uh, chains. And, and really, this is a big piece of hypocrisy on the part of the South because the South for a long time had talked about the states having their own rights and the federal government shouldn't be too strong. Well, in this case, the Fugitive Slave Act was a federal law that violated the states' rights of northern states. These northern states were against slavery. They, d they did not have... Uh, slavery, they, they were free states, and all of a sudden they're having to act like slaveholding states because they're having to help catch runaway slaves. Why was the South okay with this federal law violating the states' rights of the North? Well, because it helped them out. It gave them some of their slaves back. And so ultimately, the North and the South will become more divided over the slavery issue. And here we are in 1850. So what's interesting is that this is in 1850. The Fugitive Slave Act is going to continue to be enforced over the years, but we're still over a decade away from the Civil War actually starting. So even now the tension is high, and it's just going to get worse. Let's fast forward a couple years to another thing that makes things get worse. Harriet Beecher Stowe is going to write the most famous book of the 1850s, one of the most famous books in American history, and that book will be called Uncle Tom's Cabin. It is going to describe slavery, slave conditions. It was not always accurate. It sometimes did take the most brutal of examples of slavery. It may have exaggerated the conditions of slaves overall, but regardless of how accurate it was, it is going to have an enormous impact on the nation and on, on sectionalism. So this book is going to be graphic. It is going to make slavery look terrible. Of course, slavery was terrible. And of course, slavery could become very nasty, depending on the owner. And again, uh, it doesn't matter really how accurate the book was. It would have been an accurate description of slavery for some slaves. And in the end, what this is going to do is it's going to kind of wake up the nation on the issue of slavery. When the Northerners read this book, they are going to say, oh, this is how bad it gets. And they are going to, again, go from being indifferent towards slavery to hating slavery. And if you'll look at the reactions to both the Fugitive Slave Act and to the Uncle Tom's Cabin, it is the exact same thing. Northerners who had been indifferent towards slavery are going to start getting off the fence and start to hate slavery. So what's going to happen is more people are going to become abolitionists. More people are going to say, let's vote for the Free Soil Party and keep this uh, slavery from expanding any further. So again, some uh, Northerners are going to be wanting to keep slavery from expanding any more than it already has. Some of them are going to say, let's attack it everywhere. Basically, the combined effect of the Fugitive Slave Act and Uncle Tom's Cabin is going to be that it's going to make slavery become more of a real thing to Northerners, and when it becomes more of a reality to them, it makes it a lot harder to act like it's not a serious problem. In fact, when Abraham Lincoln meets Harriet Beecher Stowe many years later, he's going to say something to the effect of, to her, he's going to say something to the effect of, so you're the little lady that started the big war. The South hates this book. They call it being a, a, a propaganda piece full of lies. The book is literally banned in the South. You were not allowed to have a copy of this book. I'm not sure what the punishment would be, but if you were a slave, uh, you would definitely be in, in serious trouble. Uh, although most slaves could not read because they were forbidden from learning how to read. Uh, if you're a white person found with this book, you're not going to be in good shape either because the South did not want the uh, Southern whites to become anti-slavery. So the book is literally banned in the South. It's called propaganda. It's called full of lies. Uh, the North is going to become even more anti-slavery. Many Northerners are going to become abolitionists. So just like with the Fugitive Slave Act, 
Uncle Tom's Cabin is going to divide the nation even more sharply over the issue of slavery. Now this concludes this lecture. Uh, the next lecture is going to continue on through the 1850s, and you will see the issue of slavery uh, becoming even more and more divisive. I'm going to talk about actual incidents of violence that take place. You're going to see people killing each other over slavery in Kansas. You're going to see people uh, beating each other nearly to death in the United States Congress. Uh, so things are going to go from bad to worse in the next lecture. And again, by the end of this unit, we will have reached the Civil War. More on that later.